I'm Jackie and thanks so much for visiting my channel. Today's video is the third installment of my video series on college interviewing. Today I want to cover everything that happens after your interview finishes up. Everything from reporting to scoring to what interviewers are looking for. Now a full disclaimer, I am no longer an interviewer for Sanford but there are a lot of things that I need to keep secret about that process, but I'm happy to share high level insights that I've gathered from my experiences, as well as from talking to other friends who are interviewers for other top Ivy League schools. So the first thing I wanna cover is exactly what happens after the interview. So after most interviews, this is true of Stanford as well as for other alumni interviewers at other schools that I've spoken to, typically interviewers fill out two forms, one is a quantitative form, ranking you across three or four different categories that the university values. And then the other is a qualitative narrative or report that usually supplements your quantitative ratings. Typically, people use that area to write overall thoughts or to justify why they gave certain ratings, just to provide more context for the numbers that they gave. In terms of the actual quantitative scoring, Typically, it's on a scale. Stanford's was one to five. One was extremely rare, and that was really top-notch, just superb. Five was also extremely rare, and that was like, they're terrible and just not strong. In terms of how you're calibrated to score, you're supposed to give a score of three to start with, and you kind of look for things to tip the scale in one way or the other. So everyone always wants to know what gets you a one, what gets you a five. I don't have a direct answer for you, but I will say personally, when I think of ones, I think of really rare accomplishments or something really unique that I think no one else has. So in some cases, that's more obvious. If you won the Intel Science Talent Search, whatever it's called, then you are literally the one person in the entire class who has that achievement. If you are an Olympic gold medalist for a competitive sport, that's also something very unique. So I think nationwide honors often put you in the one scale. But I would caution you to think of this as a template for a one. I honestly think there are some creative things that I personally would score a one for. For an example, if you had a YouTube channel that you built from zero to a million subscribers in a year. If you can really sell a story around why your experience is unique, I really think it could be a one. Or if you were student body president, but unlike past student body presidents, maybe you built the whole student body from scratch and the student council didn't exist before you. This is why I think telling stories is so important because it helps assign value and context to your contributions instead of just making you look like another person who's applying with the exact same credentials as the applicant under you. Now on the other end of the spectrum, what gets you a five? Honestly, I think I maybe have given one lowest score and that was someone who kept interrupting me when I was speaking, who clearly wasn't listening to anything I said and asked repetitive questions, who was 30 minutes late and was just rude. And on top of that, did not have the most impressive resume. I think it's unlikely that you're that person. The next thing people want to know is what are these categories that you're being scored on? I can't tell you the exact ones, but I think I've crowdsourced enough information from peers at other schools as well as from my experiences to give you an idea of the types of qualities that they're testing for. The first is some metric around academic competence, rigor, grit, ambition. Notice I don't say raw intelligence. For Stanford specifically, I think of most of my peers as super smart, usually with really great grades in high school, but also super well-rounded. Typically, they're also extremely committed to another group on campus, whether that's a cappella or a sports team. Bottom line, to get into some of these schools, admissions officers want to know that you have the commitment and the grit to manage your time well and to excel in the activities that you pursue. So the question is then, how do you test for these? Here's some questions that I think interviewers ask to get a feel for this. Tell me about a challenge you faced. What was your biggest failure and what did you learn from it? Tell me about a time you were a leader. What was the biggest risk you took and how did it end up? The next category is I think Stanford specific and I'm choosing this because it's actually an essay question, intellectual vitality. 
So what does this word mean? And I remember the pain of this because I agonized for days about what to write about. I will say that intellectual vitality, it's really hard to put a thumb on what it means, but you kind of know it when you see it. When I think of intellectual vitality, I think of my peers at Stanford who loved learning for the sake of learning. They were always curious about how the world worked and how they could impact it. A lot of students make the mistake of thinking that the intellectual vitality answer needs to be academically related, and that is not the case. Exhibit A, I specifically wrote about my experience as an ice cream scooper at Baskin Robbins, and I wrote about how on days where it was slow, I would start pattern matching from my observations what orders people would put in based on their personality and their mannerisms. I had another friend who wrote about the parallels between classical music and punk and rock because he loved music and he was super involved in the music community once he got to Stanford. I had another friend write a really funny essay about how he would find ways to keep his little baby brother quiet when it was his turn to babysit so that he would get to watch more Netflix and play more games instead of watching his brother. There are so many ways to approach this. Don't be afraid to be funny and to be vulnerable and to let your personality and voice shine through. So what are questions that test for intellectual vitality? What are you curious about? What's your favorite book? If you had a million dollars to spend on anything you want, what would you spend it on? What's your favorite academic subject? The last thing is something around culture fit or character. And this is something, again, that is intangible, but you can get a feel for it when you speak to alumni and when you visit college campuses. So for this question, interviewers are really trying to answer a gut feeling of, can I see this person being happy on my college campus? Could I see myself hanging out with them? Would I want to grab coffee with them if I was four years younger? And the way to think about this for Stanford is people tend to be obviously very smart, but also very kind, collaborative, innovative, and just fun and down-to-earth people. They're really just testing that you are a nice and a good person that's not pretentious, even if you're probably super qualified. The questions that help people answer this question are, what would your friends say about you? What are three words you would use to describe yourself? What are your biggest strengths and weaknesses? Who are your role models? Thanks so much for watching. That's it for part three of this interview series on what happens after you finish your interview. If you like this content, please subscribe and comment below if you have any suggestions or comments. Good luck with those interviews.